and hold off till September. How's that for getting the jump start, huh? Uh, I've tried to do the last two weeks to do um, uh, Psalm 119, get it rememorized, and I was, didn't do so well with that. So I was like, man, I got to get back to Bible readings. And so I come back through Genesis, and man, I've got so much in Genesis that speaks to my soul. And I come through this yesterday, and again, I, I, other things I had laid out, but the Lord said, no, this is what you're going to bring. And um, this is what's one of those things, again, it ties in with our prayer times. What, what should we be praying for? What should we be asking for? And again, when you say that, when I say you've got any prayer requests, any, any concerns on your heart and mind, uh, that we always, so often, we've been conditioned in this in the church is that, you know, 90% of the time it becomes physical cichlids. So-and-so's in the hospital, so-and-so's sick, so-and-so's got a sore thumb, so-and-so's got, you know, we become physical things. But the balance of that should be 50-50. It should be 50% physical and it should be 50% spiritual. You know, I preached this morning, bind the strong man. And that's a spiritual warfare. You know, the guy jumps in a truck down there in Texas and shoots 21 people, kills six of them. His own life is lost by the police. Uh, and people, guy over in France takes a knife and goes through and stabs eight people, kills two. And people say, what's wrong with people's minds today and the addictions and all that kind of thing? And it's the strong man, the devil, has bound them. And you do not beat the strong man by playing pat patty cake with him. You get as strong and determined against that as what, that, what Satan is to destroy and decimate lives. And the church isn't there. Uh, so again, you don't hear spiritual requests as often as you should when I say, is there any petitions? Is there any prayer concerns? And to say, yeah, you know, I, some spiritual things where you come across that and you say, uh, like, just like that petition, I pray that the strong man be bound today. What a great prayer. Or that prayer of Evan Roberts over in uh, the Welsh Revival. Lord, shut the gates of hell for 24 hours so we can go rescue the lost. Man, I never heard a petition like that one asked before or shared before, but that's a great petition. Or that guy that was sitting before in the British National Gallery looking at General William Booth's picture there and on his knees crying and praying and weeping, Lord, do it again, the revival of the Salvation Army. Man, do it again, Lord. Do it again. I go back and talk and share about revivals because, again, in my lifetime, I want to see it. I want to see it. And I was two, three years old when Dad went to seminary at Louisville. And, again, I was too young to know any of this. But, again, he shared, and I learned later. That was the same time period, 1970, that right down the road in Lexington, Kentucky, was that Asbury College had 48 hours of night and day chapel service went on, and it never stopped. And people confessed, and people cried out. Right across from Louisville, up in, uh, what was that, St. Albans? No, not St. Albans. Uh, right across the river there in, in Indiana. You don't remember any. Clarksville. Clarksburg that there was a preacher that they brought out of Baltimore, Maryland, and they flew him out there for revival services. And that went on for like three, four weeks, night and day. Never stopped. That was in 1970. Well, again, I was just a kid. I didn't know anything. Didn't, I, you know, feed me. <laughs> Put me to bed. Change me. I, didn't, I mean, there wasn't nothing else there. That, but spiritually, that was happening right there at that time. And now I look back from that period that since 1970 to 2019, there has not been a revival in the United States that has even come close to that. There has not been, I mean, there has been God's mercy drops. You know, we sing that song, mercy drops around us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There has not been that which, hey, God showed up and this thing ain't shutting down. And it, you know, six months goes on, night and day. Uh, 1857, the great prayer movement that you hear me talk about, uh, where Lampere called for a prayer meeting. And when he started, no one was there. But by the time he ended, 
they would pray every Wednesday at noon. And time he ended, there were four other people that came in. And the next week it had doubled. And the third week it had tripled. And before it was all said and done, in six months' time from that prayer meeting, 10,000 people, there was 10,000 prayer meetings, and <laughs> one million people came to Christ in six months in the United States in 1857. When is the last time that happened? And I'm telling you that in Austin, Texas, with this seven, 24 hours for one week prayer meeting, if it's done right, God could show up. And we could see something happen in the United States that has not happened in our lifetime. You say, that's why, that's why I get upset for prayer and, and the need for prayer. I must tell Jesus. Do you know what it would look like that in one night's in 24 hours, the opiate crisis would dry up and never be part of our nation again. Do you know what that would look like? The jails shut are empty and, and, and the courts are shut because God shows up and crime stops. Homes are restored. Churches are full. You know, 100,000 people in Penn State, the football game yesterday. 60-some thousand alcoholics at WVU yesterday. All of them standing around in the parking lot. Ruby Memorial Hospital, where I have gone time and time again to pray and to minister to the sick and the dying. Standing there at Ruby Memorial Stadium with the red cups full of beer and liquor and alcohol. You know what that would look like if God showed up? You'd have 60,000 people not singing Country Roads, Take Me Home, but singing sweet hour of prayer. Yeah. Singing to God be the glory for great things he has done. Do it again, Lord, do it again. <clears throat> that's, that's a prayer. That's a spiritual prayer. Bind the strong man. Take the sins out. And you say, well, oh, there's so much wrong. There's so much wrong. What can God do? God can do anything God wants to do. But he is waiting for his people to do what they're supposed to do. And I want to be, trust and obey. I want to obey so that I can be happy in Jesus. Because when I'm not obeying God, I'm not a happy camper to be around. Am I, dear? She can, she can be here to amen that one. When I'm not right with God, everybody around me knows it. What about you? You put on a charlatan facade and hypocrisy and put on, oh, everything's good, everything's fine. It's not fine. Things aren't good. And we live in an evil world and an evil time, and we need God. Church doesn't realize that. You should realize that, don't you? We need God. So many of you prayed that in your prayer time there. Lord, help us. We need you. Well, I want to go back and look at Genesis 6 because this was another time that they needed God and they didn't understand it. And there are too many of our loved ones that are in this condition right now is that in Genesis chapter 6, at the close of chapter 5, if you don't remember this, is that the, the generations from Adam to Noah are recorded in ch chapter 5. And there, there's almost 10,000 years of history found within chapter 5 from Adam clear down to Noah. And you got men like Methuselah uh, lived how long? Anybody remember? 969. 969 years. Anybody close? <laughs> Lorena? Are you getting close? I'm getting there. You have, you have these great, you have men like Enoch. And again, the phrase with Enoch, and he was 300 years on the face of this earth, and it says that he walked with God, and he was not because God took him. Now, in this, in this chapter, in these early chapters of Genesis, you, re, you read that, one of the reasons that I picked that when we walk with the Lord. And again, I ask you that question so often before we get started on, on Sundays. How's your walk with the Lord? Where are you at with God? Is your Bible, are you prayed up, read up, serving up? Are you where you're supposed to be in this? This is because you're walking with God and you're not walking contrary to God. Enoch walked with God and God said, come on home with me and just took him. He's one of the two men on the, in the Bible that never saw death. You know, we all walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We will walk through that. The wages of sin is death. We will have to cross the Jordan River, whatever imagery or phrase that you want to use, or like sweet hour of prayer. 
when I cast off his flesh and blood and I take on that spiritual body and soul and I say as I'm in the air passing, farewell, farewell. Because to be absent from the body is to be, is to be present with the Lord. But Enoch, present with the Lord on earth and God translated it. And Elijah was the other one. The fiery chariot come down and swept them up and he, him and Enoch are the only two that never saw death on this earth. And... Uh, then you have no, and and so he was five hundred years old, and he begat three sons: Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Chapter six, we start this, and it came to pass that when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and so they took them wives of all which they of which they chose. Now again, chapter chapter. Verse 2, we start in this with verse 1 and 2, the problem. Men began to multiply. Now, again, multiplication is not a bad thing, especially when it's in the pocketbook, right? Don't you like to see your dollars go from 1 to 10, 10 to 100? To 100? No amens on that one? Okay. I won't preach the prosperity message then. I'll keep that for another day. But don't you like blessings? Lord, I got an answer prayer. Now, that's only been one answer prayer in six months. Are you satisfied with that? Man, I want a prayer answer a day. Yes. Give me, man, come on. Let, I pour out the showers of blessings on me, Lord. Now, again, when in, there is good things to increase. On the day of Pentecost, they, there was a, 120 in the upper room, and by the time the sun set that day after the day of Pentecost, it says 3,000 souls were baptized and, and joined the church. 3,000, from 120 to 3,000. That's an increase. And on another day, there was 4,000 that, that joined the church. When I'm talking about revival and a million people got saved out of our population of 30 million, one million came to Christ in six months, that's the kind of increase that I would like. But most of the time when you get increased, there's trouble with it, problems with it. When the church increased in the book of Acts, the time you get over to chapter 5 and 6, and what's the first thing to read about? And the, and the widows began to grumble, murmur. An increase with people, there's greater needs to be met, right? And so those things have to be dealt with. Here there is a population increase, and as men began to multiply, we see that there is also evil and wickedness began to multiply. Where there are much people, there is much sin. There are many sinners, and they need to be saved. At this time, there was no path of salvation or redemption, and only Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. And so there was this problem. In verse 2, we see it. Lust became a problem. And the sons of God looked on the daughters of men and lusted after them and went after them, and so they conceived these children. And again, Sons and daughters of God, that which you see meshing here together, that there are multiple interpretations about who these sons of God. Some say that they were angels. Some say that they were demons. Others says that it was the line of Seth, and the line of Seth went and found the daughters of Cain, and that they intermingled. And again, none of it's any good. Darkness, what business does light have with darkness? What business does evil have, good have with evil? None. And so you see this mingling and it all came out of the lust of the heart. And then verse 3, And the Lord said, my, my spirit, it shall not always strive with men. And again, I preached that over the last several months, awful verses in the Bible. And is that not one where God says, My spirit will not always strive with men? In other words, I, there's a time and a place that I, I, I just let the course of their actions. They, they're going to reap what they have sown. And so he says, for all that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. And some people interpret that as that time-wise, life-wise, where we saw 800, 900, Lamech was 777 years, uh, Noah was just a little bit beyond that. But you see after this is that age and years went down and, and nobody lives to be over 120 years anymore. In this. And then you also have that some interpret that is that from Noah being 500 years and another 120 years the flood has occurred and all this is done away with. And so that 120 years that you read about there, that there is an ending, there is a finish 
that God says time, life will be no more after that period of time. And then verse 4, so there were um, giants in the earth in those days and also after that, that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, that they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And people use this and say, well, that's where men like Goliath came from and the father of Goliath and the Philistines that had uh, the sons of the giant who talks about. Well, that can't be because the time that you get to this chapter, what happens to the time that you get over there to about Genesis chapter 9? The flood has destroyed all them people, hasn't it? You can't get Goliath out of this because Goliath didn't come from this. Goliath came from Noah, three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and they didn't enter in the sons of God to the daughters of men. So again, you're talking about apples and oranges here when you try to get when well, Goliath came from, from the sons of God or angels coming down and impregnating the women of this earth. That's not what that's teaching there. That's false, that's false gospel there. Then you come to verse 5, which again is the center for today. And God saw. Now again, the activity of God is very important to me because I want to know as much of God as I can possibly know. And there's two things that again, Ravenhill has drilled within my mind, my heart, and my soul, and God has planted that within me. There are two, two certainties in the church today, and I don't want to be guilty of either one of them, and I don't want you to be guilty of them. We do not know God, and we do not know the God of the Word. Now, knowing the God of the Word is by studying to show yourself approved unto God. So you hear me all the time. Are you reading your Bible? You know, have, is your Bible closed and gathering dust? Uh, are you playing your CDs, your DVDs, your 8-tracks, listening to the Word of God? Are, are you studying the Word where you get in there and you said, man, I got a hold of this and it got a hold of me and I got a promise from God and I can't let go of that? Paul, you prayed it in your prayer there, Jeremiah 33, 3. I'll bet that there's not one other thing that you said. Boy, that preacher made me memorize Jeremiah 33, 3, and I'm not going to let go of that one. And I'll ask you that till the day you die. Quote it for me, brother, and he'll be able to go right into that. Call unto me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And I preached that last week, to know. We don't know God. You ask Christians that have been in the church 60, 70 years, and you say, tell me everything you know about God. And they stumble and stammer around for, for two minutes and thinking, well, you know, God is love. And they don't know anything more than that. So I started researching this and, and writing this out, the activity of God. Grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to know who God is before I meet God. Now again, you say, well, that's an impossibility. You're exactly right, and I agree with that. God is infinite. It means God goes on and on forever, right? You cannot find He is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end and everything in between. You cannot know God. He's infinite. I'm finite. He's the creator. I'm the creation. I cannot possibly know everything about God, but that does not restrict me or limit me to, to use every capacity, my mind, my heart, my soul, my body, everything to learn who God is and to become more like him. Now, there I read about God's activity, God sees. Now again, that makes me stop. And that's a very personal thing when God got me up this morning. God, what do you see in me? He sees my good, he sees my bad. He knows my ups, my downs, my ends, my... He knows damn buys me. I'm engraved. My name is engraved on the palm of his hand. He knows how many hairs are on my head. He knows my faults and my failures inside and out. He knows what I've done the last eight months. And you said, what you do five months ago? And I said, well, wait a minute. My calendar's there. Maybe I, can rem I can't remember what I did five months ago. I'd have to look it up. Some of you don't know what you did yesterday, do you? What'd you get into yesterday? Oh, uh, well, uh... Wait a minute, it'll come to me. We, we forget God does it. Now again, I, we thank him for that verse that says, and I remember your sins no more. But the capacity here of God is beyond us. And when God sees me, what does he see? 
When God looks at His church, because today is the Lord's Day, and my mind was much filled about the sermons I had to preach today and the prayer meetings that we had to have and the gatherings that we had to have, I was very much worried about what God sees when He looks at His church. And I know that there are people saying, oh, it's a holiday weekend. You know, we're not going to be in church today. And, and I know that there are people that took off. And, and, you know, I understand all that. But again, when God looks upon his church today, do they see the power of prayer being exercised? Do they see the people of God coming, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, saying, nothing else will satisfy me. Nothing else will, will, will fill my soul. Nothing else will give me the blessings that I need from God today. What does God see when he looks upon his church? That, that's a question in my mind. That's a prayer that I offer to him. And I ask sometimes for him to answer it. And then I go to the worst. Lord, what do you see out there? And again, the horrors of out there is what mesmerizes my mind and my soul. That's what drives me to pray like I do, I must tell Jesus. You see, I see that girl, 16 years old, and I got a daughter that age, and I sympathize with that, that that's my daughter out there, just like, I don't know all those that are out there, but she has been picked up off the street. She has been thrown in a car. She has been sold to somebody. And she is in a cage right now, chained. And she has been there for months. And nobody knows where she's at. And you see the pictures and you see the posts on social media. So-and-so has been missing. Can't find her. Any information, please contact. And these girls. And they are being sold into sex slavery. And there they are for the rest of their life. Until they've been done used and abused and then killed or thrown off. Or they commit suicide because they can't stand it any longer. There is some girl in a cage right now crying out, if there is a God. Get me out of this. I don't know who she is. But my God sees that child, doesn't he? My God hears that cry from that girl. There, there is somebody sitting in church today. Went through the church services this morning. And they're sitting in a pew. And they've got a smile on their face. And they've got an angelic look about them. But deep in their heart and their soul, they've got a burden. They've got a loved one that says, I'm telling you, I'm putting on a face, but I, my heart is crying out to God. Oh God, if you're ever going to seek and save that which is lost, do it today. You know, they had a heart to heart yesterday with their son and their daughter. They sat them down and they pleaded with them. You know, time is, time is a relevant thing. You don't have all the time in the world. You, you're not going to live this life like this in disobedience to God and not, God, not expect God to respond. God sees what you're doing. And I'm pleading with you as your mother, as your father, as your brother, as your sister, as your parent, as a, as a child. I'm pleading with you, get right with God before it's too late. And, and they laughed it off and mocked and said, don't ever speak to me again about this. Oh, I'll get ready when I'm ready. I'll do what I want to do as long as I want to do it. And you know that those are the famous last words of many a fool. Because God says, time's up and I call your soul into question today. That's what moves me when I see what God sees. And God saw. Lord, what do you see in me? What do you see in your church? What do you see out there in the world? And God saw that the wickedness of man, the wickedness of men, would you like to have been there when they butchered that, that husband of that Bible translator over there in Cameroon and made that wife sit there and watch her husband get butchered and then they cut off her arm and said, don't you, we'll, we'll make sure that you don't translate the word of God anymore. God saw that, the wickedness of men. And when that guy was running around down there in Odessa, Texas yesterday firing at anybody and everybody and killed and wounded 21 and killed six and others' lives are in jeopardy and then the cops took his own life so that there were seven that lost their life yesterday. God was sitting in the heavens on his throne and he saw the wickedness of men. And every abortion clinic that someone entered into this past week and a mother saying, I don't want this child. I don't want this baby. I, I, can't, be, I can't be strapped with this. This is going to, this is going to ruin my life. And they forgot that there was a life there. And they took that life. God saw that act 
of evil. God sees the wickedness of men and he knows. And he saw that it was great in the earth. And as bad as things are today, it is as that we read that where Jesus said, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of God returns. Things are bad, and it's been worse than what we would say 30 years ago, but I don't think that it was as bad as this because, again, there was only eight that got on the boat, and there were thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people that had multiplied upon the face of the earth during this time, and when God looked down, he found none that found grace in his sight, except for Noah. And he saw that every imagination of the thought of the heart was only evil continually. You know, again, people don't understand this, but again, you can be tempted, and temptation is not sin. We all understand that. But the thought of it continually being in the mind is the constant thing of evil, that Satan is just prodding along there, dropping the seeds of evil. If I can just keep bringing this up, if I can just keep digging this dagger, eventually they will follow suit. And I shared this not too long ago. We talked about this. It wasn't, I don't believe, one and done that Satan showed Eve that fruit, that tree that was on the fruit and said, oh, doesn't that look good over there? And she just, oh, yeah, I think I'll go over there and pick that fruit and eat it, even though I know God said don't, we could eat of any fruit of the garden except for that one. He stayed after her in this. And there are people that are struggling with this day after day after day that this thoughts in their mind and their heart saying, do this evil, do this sin. And they said, I can't do this. I, I'm, I'm a Christian. I can't fall prey to this. I won't be a part of that. Satan just stays after him. And again, I preach it as I preached it this morning. The strong man has not been bound. And God saw all this wickedness and he saw the evil thoughts that were continually upon people's lives today. And that's the reason that I say, when I say, is there any prayer requests, is that one of the first things with spiritual warfare that we've got to pray, the thoughts of men are continually evil. That's why they pick a gun up and walk into a, a school and shoot it up. That's why they walk through the streets of this city and, and do it. There was a mother, just this past week, there were three or four murder-suicides in, in our country. That's all that I saw toasted, but there might be more. But there was one mother who got on social media and she said, my children are the best children. She had, I think, three kids. And she said, I'm telling you, I am such a blessed mother to have such great kids. And she got off the social media and she killed all of her three children and then killed herself. Now you say, what, what, what is this craziness? This is the evil of minds that's going on. Our spiritual warfare is on the minds and the hearts of people today that Satan owns and occupies. And we think that one or two hours here on Sunday is going to cover for the rest of the 168 hours in a week? Don't be insane. That's the reason, is that you have to have enough discipline about you day in and day out to get up and be with God. And Paul, you said, got to get up in the morning and be in the Word. Feed your soul. Get a book. Get a devotional. Get a sermon. Get on there and listen to me. Listen to someone, if not me. Occupy your time, Monday, Sunday through Sunday, with the things of God because Satan is occupying the thoughts and the minds and the hearts of people that you and I both know with evil. And that's why they're acting out on it today. And you say, well, that's always been happening. But now he has free course. Satan, God has withdrawn himself. Ichabod is upon our nation. You know, the glory of the Lord has departed. You say, why has it been since 1970 that revival hasn't come to, the, to our nation? It is because of the church. Don't, don't point at the White House. Don't point at the Congress. Don't point at the Supreme Court. You point, heard it, point at the church house. Mm -hmm. The church has left God. We, we, like I said, 80% don't even have a prayer meeting. Once a month, how hard is it to have a one-hour prayer meeting per month? And 80% of our churches are not praying. They're not in the Word. I've asked pastors, hey, where are you at in your Bible reads? Well, I haven't opened my Bible. I open my only time I open my Bible is on Saturday night to get a message for Sunday. They don't study the Word. Most, most preachers I know have never read the Bible through that was out in seminary. 
When I was out seminary, 90% of them had never read the Bible through, and they was the ones standing in the pulpits today. I was one of the, I was one of the weirdos that not only had preached uh, in the pulpit, but also had read the Bible through several times. Most of them don't read their Bibles. They get a sermon for Sunday in that. And their minds are occupied with social media, with sports. When you talk to most preachers, it's like talking to people in the pews of the church today. Hey, what's what, what's going on? Well, did you watch that ball game yesterday? You want to talk about sports? Hey, what you think of that? How, what do you think of that hurricane coming? They want to talk about weather. Hey, did you read that editorial about what Trump said and what this? Said? They want to talk about politics. You know how hard it is to find Christians that want to talk about God. Did you see that rainbow in the sky that God set there? Forget about the LGBT trying to steal the rainbow. God <laughs> set that in the clouds as a reminder not to destroy the earth anymore by flood. So bring on hurricane, whatever it's called down there, and the 30 inches of water that's happening. The world is not going to be destroyed by flood. Second Peter chapter 3 tells us it's going to be destroyed by fire. And it'll be consumed. <clears throat> The heavens and the earth and all that is therein shall be consumed in a fiery fervent spirit in that. But again, God sees, God knows. And so verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. No God, there's God's heart. That's one of the few places that you read in Scripture about God's heart. God's heart was grieved. And I think again personally, God forgive me. For all the times that I grieved your heart. For all the times that you trusted me, believed in me, and I and I dropped it. I, I failed. I grieved your heart. Has there been anything worse than that? When when a child comes to the parent and, and, and the parent looks at the child with saying, You broke my heart. You broke my heart. Or the parent doing it to the child. The child says, you know, I expect the more. You're, you're the mom, you're the dad, and you failed me, and, and you broke my heart. There's nothing worse than heart pain, is there? And I'm not talking about having a heart attack. I'm talking about having your heart broke. Well, ain't we all been there at one point or another? This means yes. This, oh, yeah. Most of us have had heartache, heartbreak. And again, here's God's heart. Greed. He created the earth. He created the man. He created all that is. And, and again, you go back to Genesis chapter 1, the very last verse, and when God saw all that he created, and it was good. God did good. And then what did men do? They destroyed it by contaminating it with all of their sins. And his heart was broke. And all the church would be as empathetic with God, as saying, God, I would not do anything to break your heart. Jesus looked at the city of Jerusalem and it says, and he wept over it. And he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you under my wings, but you would not. Christ's heart was broke. When he looked at Judas sitting across at the Last Supper and he said to God and all the disciples were saying, who is it that's going to betray you? Lord, is it I? Is it I? And he said, it's the one that I dip in the cup with the salt at the same time. And he dipped in there and he handed it to Judas and he said, that thou thou doest do quickly. And his heart broke because that was his friend. And there's nothing worse to heartache when friends betray you. God's heart was broke. And the Lord said, I will destroy. Oh, when God says something, it's the absolute getting ready to happen. And God says, and I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. And again, you say, well, that's not going to happen for many years to come when God destroys this earth. I'm worried about who God's destroying right now. I'm worried about those that God's going to destroy today. And I look at names and faces in my mind and in my heart, and I see them out there, and I see that guy drinking himself drunk, and he's getting ready to pass out of this world. And I see that drug addict, and he's getting ready to take his last fix because he's going to die and have a cardiac arrest right there on the spot. And I see that person driving down the road, and God's not going to protect them because nobody's praying for their protection. And Satan has full rights and reign to them, and he's going to take them out of this world, and God's going to let them be destroyed. And I cry out to God, Oh, God, please don't destroy, deliver. And I see Tuesday when schools go back into session, 
that somebody's getting ready to go into do a mass shooting in a school and I say, God, as you hear me pray, you are the Lord of hosts. Put your heavenly host round about that property and protect them on north, south, east, and west. And don't let that destruction happen, but deliver. God is a destroyer or God is a deliverer? Which one do you want? Deliverer. Deliver. And I will destroy. For it has repented me that I have even made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And every true child of God sitting here today that has been redeemed, born again, saved, guess what you found? You found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Oh, amen, dear there. I, I don't deserve heaven. I don't deserve grace. I don't deserve love. I don't deserve mercy. But God looked down. God saw me, a sinner, consumed with self, born in a day and a time that I did not have to be saved. But God said, by grace, I will save you. I'm not going to destroy you. I'm going to deliver you. I'm not going to condemn you. I'm going to receive you. I'm not going to send you into hell. I'm going to bring you into heaven. And he did it because God is gracious and merciful and long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. And God keeps his word. Oh, that day that I found grace in God's sight. I thank him a thousand times over and may I thank him ten thousand more times because I can never say it enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you that I found grace. And Paul writes over there in the New Testament, by grace, by grace I am what I am by the grace of God. Thank you, God, for grace. Undeserved, unearned, redemption from God. And then we go down through this in verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect. Oh, you don't have to be perfect. Well, they're perfect. And there are generations of Noah, and there he said, walk with God. And Abraham walked with God. And David walked with God. Wouldn't you like to have been Jesus? Come walk with me. Don't you think Jesus is saying that to his children today? At the close of the Lord's day, if the rain doesn't come in, let's just go have a walk. My favorite verse is over there in the book of Genesis where Isaac, Isaac went out to the evening, in the evening tide and he walked in the field. Now, it doesn't say he walked with God, but wasn't nobody else out there. And there have been too many times up and down the hills and the, and the fields of Hampshire County and Mineral County that I've gone out in the evening time to walk with God. And brother and sister, we sang a song when we walk with the Lord, and I'm asking you right now, are you walking with God? Yes. Are you in oneness with God? And God, you stretch up your hands, and God reaches down his hands because God sees you and God has had grace upon you and God doesn't want to destroy you and God says, let's go walk. Yes, Lord, let's go walk. And the idea of this is walk with the Lord. And if you're not walking with God, then you better get yourself straightened up and you better get yourself toned up and you better get your sneakers and tennis shoes on and go find a path and walk with God. Because everything that God sees out there is not good. And he's ready to destroy it. And that includes the pictures on the walls in your homes. And on your end tables. And, and in your bedroom. Your family and your friends, God is getting ready to destroy in this nation today. And he can do it just like that if he wants. But again, he shows mercy and restraint. And that's the reason that I said, if there's one thing, God give us time. He said, I've already given you time, but Lord, give me more time. Please, God, please, God, give me time for my loved one's sake, for your name's sake. You don't want to destroy them. You don't want to obliterate them. So, God, I ask of you, I beg of you, please give me time. Let me preach one more sermon. Let me pray one more prayer meeting. Let me have one more divine encounter with them. Let me have one more heart-to-heart -heart with them. But, God, don't destroy them. I'm begging you, God. You see, I, I, get, I get in the moment. I must tell Jesus all that's on my heart and my mind because this is what's at stake. God sees them. God is filled with anger and wrath against our nation and against these people because they have slighted him and provoked him and angered him. And you and I as the church are left here to plead with God. Please, 
please God, don't do this. And so from the age of 500 to the age of 600, Noah built an ark. 100 years to build this ark. And for 100 years, he preached to them. And for a hundred years, day in and day out, he gave them an invitation from God, the God of creation, the God who made all of them and said, God is going to destroy us. God is going to consume us. And they laughed at him and they mocked him and they refused to listen to him until the day that the Lord shut them in. God shut them in in the doors of the ark. And how many people got on the boat? Eight. Noah, his wife, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and their three wives, and no more. And what happened to the rest of civilization? What happened to the sons of God and the daughters of men that they lusted and procured greater and greater wickedness and evil? What happened to them? They drowned, and they were consumed, and they were destroyed. I will destroy them, and God did. And I know that the same God of yesterday, of Genesis 6, is the same God of today, 2019, and maybe the same God of my future. And so I am left to find grace in the sight of the Lord, to plead with him, don't destroy us, but have mercy upon us. And then in the next verse, and, and the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence, violence. Just like I already quoted, murder, suicides, homicides, mass shootings, abuse. You're always <laughs> talking about it, road rage. You know, I'm glad that your road rage has not culminated to those people. That one guy was so full with rage, he got out, pulled out an AK-47, and just shot all the cars up that were round about him. He was so filled with rage. Violence. This is what we're reading about and seeing, and the earth was filled with violence. And it's happening again. And so Noah, and it says in this, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, and all flesh had corrupted his ways upon the earth. Corruption inside and out and everything else around. I, I go to these places and these things, and all I see is corruptions. Everything that God made, in the image of God, made us. Let us make man in our image created after our likeness. You're a child of God. God breathed life into you. God gave life to you. And man has corrupted it. They're all tatted up and pierced up and they're all defiled and they're all filthy and, and all as they do is run from one partner to the next and corrupt themselves in their minds and their hearts and their bodies and God looks down from heavens and sees it and if you say anything against their corruption, they look at you and say, you're judging me. I'll live any way I want. But God sees them that they've been corrupted as well. When are we going to ever see a correction? When you preach, don't corrupt yourself. Don't act like the world. Don't be like the world. Don't look like the world. We're supposed to act like God, be like God, and look like God. And they have corrupted themselves. Come out from among them and be you separate. What business does light have with darkness? What business does goodness have with evil? And then God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with all the earth. That time is a coming. And there is limited time that you and I have. And even if the Lord comes back in our lifetime, which he may, you and I are limited on how many days we have on the face of this earth, don't we? But this much I can assure you, you ain't going to live 969 years, no matter how many ramps you eat, Steve. <laughs> no matter what physical training that you have. Well, I'll have you know I'm walking eight miles a day, and I'm working out, and I'm eating right. You're going to die before 120. And you ain't going to see 969 years. And I can also pretty much say, although God may correct me if I speak beyond my means here, is that you're not going to be like Enoch and Elijah and whisk out of this old world unless it's because he splits the eastern sky and the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. But you're not going to have no special invitations like Enoch 
and Elijah had. We are limited. So while we have time, and while we have opportunity, and while we have availability, walk with God. Be for God what he wants you to be. See what God sees. Know what breaks God's heart. And if your heart's not broke with what God breaks God's heart, then you're not at one with him. And if you don't see what God sees out there in this world, then take the scales from your eyes and blind Bartimaeus finally see again. See God's actions here. Know who God is and know that you and I are living in a day that parallels very much the same as Noah. And we're in trouble. And our community is in trouble. And our nation's in trouble. And if anybody else is in trouble, it's the church. God looks down at his bride, the church, and he says, what did you do? I gave you a white dress that was cleansed and pure, and you went out there in the mud hole and romped around. Thought it was okay to drink and carouse and live and participate in the things of the world when I said, don't do that. And the things that I did say, do this, you said, no, I won't do that. You was in direct rebellion and defiance against me. And you have defiled yourself with all the things of this world. Come out from among them and be clean and be holy. God, make me holy. That one song that I played that I did get right because the music was in front of me, Sanctuary. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy tried and true. Make me a sanctuary. Lord, I know that you see me today. Lord, I know that you see my brothers and sisters here today. Lord, I know that you see those that are out there today that didn't think about you at all today. And they don't love you. And they don't know you. And they're not going to find grace in your sight. They're going to find wrath. And so, Lord, in wrath, I beg of you, remember mercy. Help me today, O oh God, to be what you want me to be. Help your church to be what it's supposed to be. And may I never from this day forward, God, do not let me or them break your heart like we read in Genesis 6. You go out of here today with a determination. Lord, don't let me break your heart. My heart's been broken and hurt. Painful. Some of you still shattered, never recovered from it. But, oh, God, don't let me break your heart. Save the lost. Get them on that boat. Rescue and redeem. Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. Lord, do it again. Send revival. May we be spirit-filled, holy-filled, lives living for Christ, to all that we see and come across because their souls are in jeopardy of eternity and they're not ready. So our invitation today is to prepare for that, for what God would have of us to be and to do.